For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We're out here tonight with the glorious truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Lord, which is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, whether you are a Jew or Gentile, makes no difference for all who call upon the name of Jesus Christ the Lord shall be saved. And it's our hope and prayer tonight that you would not only acknowledge Jesus as your Savior, but that you would know that Jesus is Lord. And the Bible teaches very clearly in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit of God. Tonight we're going to be sharing with you the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Lord. This is a message of good news to sinners who know that they have sinned and want to be saved, want to be reconciled to God, want to know God. There's many people in their sin tonight that who are under the law, who are under the condemning wrath of Almighty God that is due them for their sin. People today do not understand what sin is. Oftentimes sin is something that people gloss over, they pass over, they don't acknowledge what the big deal is, but it's important for each and every one of us to know something about what sin is. And before we really get to that, it's important to know something about the purpose of man. The purpose of man and how God has created all things in the very beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 1. And on the sixth day, man, God made man in his own image and in his own likeness with the express purpose that we would live for him and for his glory, that he, we would do those things that are pleasing to the Lord, that we would obey him and walk in his way all the days of our life. There's things that the Lord has planned for man, the things that God wants man to do, and that's exactly what God delineated to man in the creation mandate supported by the covenant of works. So God placed man in the Garden of Eden. This man, Adam, his name is Adam, and he was going to be in the Garden of Eden. This was going to be a time of testing as to whether or not he would believe the word of the Lord. And why that's important is because what is necessary with the Lord is faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So Adam, in this time of testing in the Garden of Eden, would he obey the Lord? The Lord said, Of all the trees of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest of it thou shalt surely die. So in this covenant of works, which is representative of the law of God, the Lord God expected of Adam perfect and complete obedience. It was not like there was any room for Adam to dicker with God. God is a sovereign, holy, just, righteous God. He is the creator of all things, and he has the authority to instruct us in his ways and to expect us to live for him and for his glory. He's the one that makes the rules. The question is, are we going to obey God according to his word and his will and in his ways? Oftentimes we have a way of thinking that we're going to go ahead and live our own life in our own ways. But that's not how it works when you're dealing with a holy God that expects perfect and complete righteousness to be in his presence. And so Adam in the Garden of Eden was in a place of testing. This was a very important place of testing. Would he obey the word of the Lord? The Lord God expects perfect and complete obedience to be in his presence and Adam uh, soon thereafter proved himself to be disobedient and unbelieving. He proved himself to lack something that's very important and that something is faith. 
And faith is something that's very interesting. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. We learn about that in the book of Hebrews chapter 11. Very important to read the whole Bible to know what it is that the Lord teaches in His Word, which is special revelation given to His people. This man, Adam, was uh, responsible to obey the Word of the Lord, to obey the Lord God completely without any fail. And there is in this a certain promise of blessing. He would have life if he would obey the Lord and death if he did not. The consequence for any transgression is death. And that's supported in the Bible in Romans chapter 6. For the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And that is affirmed in Genesis chapter 2. So we know that God expects perfect righteousness. And Adam in the garden sinned against the Lord. Adam sinned against the Lord. And what transpired thereafter was a complete transformation of man. From Adam thereafter, Adam being the first man, and those that would follow him, every one of us is born into sin. We all have a sin nature that is inherited by the first man, Adam. So what he did in the garden had consequences that would affect the whole of humanity. If he obeyed the Lord, there would be blessing that would be passed down but if he would disobey the Lord, there would be a cursing. There would be a judgment. And this is what we see uh, actually happen when Adam sinned. Uh, all men have been brought under this curse of the law. This is very important because this law is a heavy burden. It's a heavy weight uh, for sinners to bear. And the only way that we can uh, have this weight removed is through Jesus Christ the Lord. So what we find in the Garden of Eden is that Adam failed. Adam sinned against the Lord and as a result of this sin has passed upon all men. Death has passed upon all men for that all have sinned. And this is very significant because Adam was ultimately sent out of the Garden of Eden, out, of the, out from the presence of the Lord and the way of the tree of life was guarded by cherubim. This is very important because the natural man would want to go back into the, to the garden, into the presence of the Lord, and he would want to try to correct the wrong that was done. The problem is once a man has sinned against the Lord, there is no going back without a sacrifice. There is no going back without a sacrifice. So the natural man would want to go back into the garden. He would want to make things right. He would want to be able to approach the Lord on his own terms and in his own way. But he was prevented from going back and partaking of the tree of life. And we can be very thankful for that tonight, that uh, he did, was not permitted to go back and partake of the tree of life. Because had he done that, you and I today would not have any hope of redemption. We would be forever in a state of sin without any opportunity to uh, be redeemed. And so we know that uh, this way of life was guarded by angels and sinful man was not permitted to go back into the presence of the Lord. So the question for us tonight is how is it that this relationship between man and God can be restored? How is it in this predicament that we find ourselves in tonight that we are sinners in the hands of an angry God? How is it tonight that we, anybody, can be reconciled to God when that way unto the Lord is guarded? You see, God is a holy God, and to stand in His presence, you must be completely, perfectly righteous and without any sin. 
And the problem is, even in our best days, at our best time, we remain sinners in the hands of an angry God. The book of James tells us very clearly that if you keep the whole of the law and yet offend, in one point you are guilty of the whole thing. This is very, very significant for us because it shows us that there is nothing that we can do in earthly terms to ever bridge the gap between God and man. There's nothing you and I can do to ever merit eternal life. There's nothing that you and I could ever do to earn our way into heaven and into the good graces of God. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. So in this one very statement, we see that the only way back to the Father, the only way to be reconciled to the Father, the only way of salvation, the only way to be delivered from your sin and to have your sins forgiven and to receive the imputed righteousness of Christ you must be born again. So this is what it is, is we are born into this world as sinners, and Jesus says, you must be born again. So then this is found in the Gospel of John chapter 3. So in this we see a natural and a spiritual reality. Naturally speaking, you and I, we all are born into this world through the procreation of our parents. But make no mistake about it, one plants, another waters, but it's God that gives the increase. Uh, the soul of man comes from God. And this is very important because when God gives life, we don't have a right to take that life away because this life, all souls come from God and all souls belong to God. So the reality is, is our sin is something that is such an egregious offense against God. And the only way that our sins can be forgiven is by way of sacrifice. The problem is that you and I could never uh, bring about any such sacrifice that would ever merit anything that would satisfy God because God requires a perfect sacrifice for sin. When we look at the law, we gain an understanding of what sin is and the egregious nature of sin. And the law can be summed up into to two commandments, and that is to love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, with all thy strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. This is a whole sum of the law and the prophets summed up in two. So if you were to go to Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 5 and read about the law of the Lord, the moral law of God, the Ten Commandments, what you would find is this: these are ten commands that come from the Lord. And it tells us something about the nature and relationship between God and man as well as man in relation to other men. And so what's so very important is that the Lord says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And it's very important to know that in the world today, there are many gods, little g-gods, that people look to. But we know that the Bible is very clear that there's only one God in heaven above. The Lord says in his word, I am the Lord and beside me there is no other God. Very important to know what the Bible has to say about it. God is God and God alone. And it's high time that we acknowledge this God of the Bible, that we acknowledge the King of glory, and that we surrender our life before him. The Lord says, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And yet so many, America today is full of something that displeases the Lord. America today and the nations around the world are full of idolatry. You don't have to go very far to find idolatry. But you know what? The saddest part of all is the idolatry that exists in the heart of man. What are those gods 
that you have set up in your heart and in your lives that are against the Lord of glory. Who's in charge of your life? Who is the Lord of your life? Who do you belong to in your life? Where the gods have you set up in your life before the Lord of glory? He says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it's high time that we acknowledge that idolatry is sin. Idolatry is anything that takes the place of God in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds. And so what idols do you have in your hearts? What idols do you have in your lives? What kind of idols do you have? Let me tell you something about idols that's very important to know something about. When you have an idol, an idol is an object. And those objects turn into an image. They are an image. And those images are designed to be worshipped. You see that in the Roman Catholic Church. You see that in many of the religions of the world. The, the idolaters establish an image and that they demand man to worship that image. And so we know that this is something that God clearly forbids. This is not something that pleases God. The Bible says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And it's time that we as Americans and people around the world acknowledge the word of the Lord. When we disobey the Lord, that brings with it certain consequences. And let me tell you something, there's no other God like Yahweh. Today is the day of salvation. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and all thy house. The Bible says, Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. We talked about that a little bit because images are objects of worship. God wants us to worship Him and to worship Him alone. There's many people in the world today that they have a little cross that they put around their neck. And this little cross oftentimes gives people great comfort. And maybe sometimes it's even a matter of a good luck charm. But let me tell you something. But it's time not to look at that cross on the necklace. It's time to look to the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ and acknowledge what he's done for sinful men like you and I. Because as we've been talking about tonight, the only way to get back to God is by sacrifice. And the cross is where we see the Lord Jesus Christ some 2,000 years ago who died on the cross as an atonement for sin, for the sin of all those people who would believe on him. He died as an offering. as a, He offered himself as an offering for sin, as a sacrifice for sin, as an atoning sacrifice that would appease the, the Lord of glory. This he did on behalf of his own people, and it's high time that we acknowledge this sacrifice and what it actually means for you and I. This was a substitutionary atonement. Jesus did not have any sin of his own. He took upon himself the sin and, and iniquity of his own people, and in return he imputes to them his righteousness when they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. The question is tonight, do you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? Have you been reconciled to God? Do you know for sure that you belong to the Lord tonight? Do you know the Lord of glory? Have you been born again by the Spirit of the true and the living God? The Bible says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. The Lord is not going to, he's not going to, those people that take the name of the Lord Thy God in vain are in trouble with the Lord. Now taking the name of the Lord, thy God in vain, is not simply using a cuss word. That's bad enough. That is bad in and of itself. But this has a lot more to do with not giving God glory that is due his holy name. It's more about people who claim to know the Lord, and yet they continue in their sin. They claim to know Jesus but they live like the devil. They claim to be born again, but they are living in sin. This is taking the name of the Lord, thy God, in vain. It's making light of the Lord. Even using the Lord as a cuss word is not a good thing. It's a very, very bad thing, showing contempt for the Lord himself. That's not a good thing 
to shake your fist at God and to defy God and to rebel against God. Today is the day of salvation. Cry out to Jesus in repentance and faith. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The Sabbath day is the, the seventh day. This is a day of rest. And one of the things I love about reading about the Sabbath is that the Sabbath is something that is made for man. Man was not made for the Sabbath. The ma Sabbath was given for man. And this was a time set apart from the Lord, by the Lord, to worship the Lord, to take rest from your labors throughout the week and to worship the Lord and to devote this time unto the Lord. Uh, even in the book of Ephesians chapter 5, we read about, Be ye therefore imitators of God as dear children. So in this, even in this one passage of Scripture, since God worked six days in creating the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh day, he wants us as well to acknowledge him and what he has done and to be imitators of God and to rest ourselves on the Sabbath day. Unfortunately, we in America and around the world are so busy doing what we are doing that we do everything but rest on the Lord's day. But it's high time that we reconsider the Sabbath. It's high time that we reconsidered this aspect of rest and the importance of rest. But this Sabbath speaks of something even greater than uh, having the day off on Sunday and resting and worshiping the Lord with the people of God. This rest ultimately speaks about the rest that belongs to the children of God. You know, there's coming a time of an eternal rest. And it, when you come to faith and trust in Jesus Christ the Lord, you cease from your own re works and you rest in the Lord and in His finished work of redemption. You no longer are striving and working and clamoring, but you are resting in Him and in His finished work and what He's done for you. This is very, very serious to enter into the rest of the Lord. You can find that in the book of Hebrews and of this rest that belongs to those people who repent of their sins and place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ the Lord. But this rest even speaks even further of a consummated rest in the kingdom of God in the eternal state when there won't be any more bondage to sin. There won't be any death. There won't be any sickness. There won't be any disease in the new heavens and in the new earth. There truly will be eternal rest for the souls of men that have been reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ the Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It's our hope and prayer tonight that you would enter into the rest of the Lord, that you would cease from your own labors and from your own works, and that you would trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is a good God and a gracious King, and He commands all men everywhere to repent of their sins and to place their faith and trust in Him. The Bible says, Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, and yet we in America and around the world don't have time for our parents. Oftentimes our, our children today and teenagers and young adults have no time to honor their father and mother, and yet this is a command that comes from the Lord that comes with much promise from the Lord that your days would be long on the earth. Let me tell you something, folks. God wants us to honor mom and dad. God wants us to place them in proper fear and respect. <coughs> this, doesn't, this doesn't mean that they, that, they, that they have the right to control your life, but especially when you are an adult, it's so important. As children, it's important to honor your father and mother and to obey your parents. Uh, they, the parents are people that love you and they know oftentimes what's best for you. And it's important to take heed to their counsel. But it's also important even as you get older to 
acknowledge your parents and acknowledge who they are and the gift that they are, that God has given you wonderful parents to be your parents. This is something that God expects, that we would reverence them, that we would show compassion uh, towards them, that we would help them, and that we would be there for them. They, they've done so much for us anyways, how can we but, but be there to help support them, especially as they grow older. So the Bible says to honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, but even in this there is this concept of honoring and respecting those people who are in authority. And so it's so important for us to acknowledge that the word of the Lord is true, and God knows exactly what he's talking about with his word, and it's important that we learn to take heed to the word of the Lord. Learn to take heed to the word of the Lord. The Bible says that thou shalt not kill, and yet in America alone, there's been more than 65 million babies that have never lived to see the light of day in the abortion mills. This is tragic. This is barbaric. This is genocide, and yet women still claim today that uh, it's my body, my choice. But let me tell you something, folks. Uh, this life, when you understand that life comes from God, and God says, thou shalt not kill, you know that we do not have any right to take the life of another, with few exceptions being uh, that for punishment, for murder, and things like that, that take a capital crime. Uh, that is something that's covered under the law of God. But we're talking about taking the life of the innocent. We're talking about murdering people without cause. We're talking about taking away somebody else's life unjustly. And so this is what it means to, to kill. This is, a, this is a prohibition against murder. And, and yet even, even today we have a holocaust in America where more than 65 million babies have never lived to see the light of day because they've been slaughtered in the womb of their mother in abortion mills right here in America. And those numbers are growing and exceeding. And even today we have, before the legislature, we have uh, laws that are trying to be passed this voting season that would allow people to further the, this, uh, this killing of the innocent babies. These things ought not so to be, and this is just one example, but let me tell you something. Uh, there's a difference between the, ba the, the right of the mother and the right of the baby who is another individual in her mother, in its mother's womb. These are two separate individuals with two different souls. The mother has a right to take care of her own body, but that does not include extinguishing the life of her little baby that's inside of her womb. That would be called murder in God's eyes, and God forbids such evil. But we're not just talking about abortion. We're talking about the even the effects of abortion and what it means to a society because when you don't have any love and respect and honor for God, this is translated into not having love and respect for little babies, but it goes further. It goes further to the point where people don't have love and respect for their elders and for the older folks. And so then you have euthanasia. We have, we have uh, discussions about uh, ending the life of mom and dad. These things are not so to be. Uh, this even goes to uh, getting rid of the undesirables, no matter who those undesirables might be. It's so important that once you go down that road and you defy the, the Lord in this matter, there are seismic consequences that go throughout the whole of creation. And God will not hold anyone guiltless that does these things. These are all classified as sin against the Lord, a reproach, a transgression against the law of the Lord. The Bible says, Thou shalt not commit adultery. Adultery. Very important. Thou shalt not commit adultery. And yet America is one of those nations that's given to adultery in many aspects and in many ways. <coughs> and adultery is at, at basically at the most basic definition has to do with 
two married people going outside of the bond of marriage and having relations with somebody else that's not in that relationship and that covenant of marriage. Now this is very important because this adult adultery often relates to as well spiritual adultery. They go hand in hand and it's a turning away from the Lord. It's a turning away from covenant relationship with the Lord. And so there are significant consequences, not to, just to the lives of the people, but to the family unit and to society at large. And this is something that has a way of corrupting society. And, you know, oftentimes as well, when you want to look at the epidemic of abortion in America, one of the things that is driving this abortion holocaust in America and around the world is sexual immorality. And it's time to repent before God. It's time to acknowledge that uh, the sin that God has called out in His Word and to acknowledge that you've sinned against the Lord no matter what it is. It can even be a matter of a, a sin of the heart. Sin is not just an act. It's also a matter of the heart. Have you sinned before the Lord in word, thought, and in deed? Well, sure you have. We all have. The Bible says we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Very important to understand that. The Bible says thou shalt not steal, and yet people take things that don't belong to them all of the time. And you know what's interesting about all of these commands of the Lord found in Exodus 20 is that they are all connected together. And so when you, for instance, you look about this matter of thou shalt not steal, it's connected with thou shalt not kill. Because ultimately when you are killing somebody, you are stealing their life. You are robbing them of life. And this is, this is theft. This is taking something that does not belong to you. Now that's just one example, but they are, all the laws of God are interconnected. You break one, you break them all. They all go together. This is uh, what we're demonstrating a little bit tonight is the holiness of God and the perfections of God and His holy character. And if you stray in any way from this standard, you uh, have sinned against the Lord. And that's what the Lord is teaching us in this. The Lord is giving us a knowledge of sin uh, by His Word, by His law. It gives man a knowledge of sin. The Bible says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Now this is very important, especially when you're going to a court of law, not to bear false witness against your neighbor. There's lots of people that tell things that are not true. But let me tell you something. When you do this, you are even stealing from your neighbor. If you're saying something that's not true about your neighbor, let's say you're testifying in court, uh, about somebody and what they did or didn't do, and it's not true, uh, you're bearing false witness, but you're also stealing something from these folks. And so all these laws are uh, interconnected. Very important to know and understand that. The Tenth Commandment, the Lord says, Thou shalt not covet. And what's interesting about coveting is coveting is a taking, wanting something that belongs to somebody else, lusting after the things of another, not being content with what you have, but wanting the things of others. And the Lord forbids this activity. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, this covetousness is a sin of the heart. And this, again, is something that each and every one of us have to deal with in one way or another. Each and every one of us are lawbreakers. And uh, one of the beautiful things about the law of the Lord is that the law shows us the standard of God's perfect righteousness. And yet, when we consider this law and examine ourselves against this law, we find out that we have sinned against the Lord because we've broken these commands of the Lord. And the consequence or the punishment for breaking God's law is death. Not just death, but eternal death and separation from God. And this is something that not only affects us in this world, but in the world to come. It's so important to know and understand that there are serious consequences for, for our sin. And the ultimate punishment is death, eternal separation from a holy God in the lake of fire for all of eternity. 
This is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. This is a place where the wind dieth not and the fire is never, ever quenched. This is a place, the lake of fire is a place that once you go into it, you can't come out of it. Once you're there, you're there forever. That's why we're imploring you in the name of Jesus tonight to be reconciled to God. Because, you know, when you, when you recognize your sin, when you acknowledge that you have sinned against the Lord, when you acknowledge that the, the wages of sin is death, it's so important to, to know the rest of the Bible verse. It says the wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ the Lord. So while we are in a terrible predicament in this world today, while you and I have broken every law of God without exception, and while you and I deserve the just punishment of our sin, which is death, separation from God for all of eternity, our only hope of salvation the only hope of being delivered from the bondage of this sin, the only hope from being set free from this being under the law of sin and death, the only hope that any of us have to have our sins forgiven and to be reconciled to God is to call upon the name of Jesus Christ the Lord because he came into the world some 2,000 years ago to save his people from their sins. You know what, this just shows you the contempt that you have for God. How sad is that? You are a young lady making such a stand and position against abortion or for abortion. Why would you do that? Why would you do that? It is worse. How many people have been aborted in America since Roe v. Wade in 1973? How many? Wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. I, you need to know. More than 65 million babies. Just in America. What, what, why? What, what, wait, what, we're talking about genocide, okay? So in the Holocaust, how many, how, that's not good either, okay? But, but let's think about something. In the Holocaust, how many Jews died? Uh, how, how many? Don't bother these people. If you believe in something, just keep how, it how many Jews? How many Jews? How, how many Jews died yeah, in the Holocaust? Six million, about six million. So since 1973, we, back soon, my man. Amen, amen. Okay, so we there's been more than 65 million babies. No, it's not, not ma'am. It's not opinion. There is no it's not opinion. It is a genocide. Okay. Think about what a genocide represents. It's a slaughter of nations. People that will never live to see the light of day. So you're doing abortion for your own convenience, but God says thou shalt not kill. God says thou shalt not kill. God's going to hold you accountable for your sin on Judgment Day. So a very interesting discussion about people that think that uh, abortion is okay. And it's really sad when you have young ladies like this that have hardly started their lives and they've already given themselves over such, to such treachery and barbarism. Well, let me tell you something. This is nothing new. It, we see this for them, but this is nothing new because it's something that men hold in common. We all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we all have a sin nature that rebels against the Lord and doesn't want to have anything to do with the Lord. And so, But the good news is that if you know that you're a sinner, and it bothers you tonight that, that you know that the wages of your sin is death, Love your boldness. Amen. A true man of God. Thank you. I'm a definitely a believer. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So if you're a person like I am, and you come to that place where you acknowledge that you have sinned against God, the question next is, what is your hope? If you know that you have sinned against God and, and God punishes sinners and the wages of our sin is death, then what hope do any of us have for eternal life? This is the question we need to be asking ourselves. If we know that we have sinned against God and the punishment for that sin is eternal death in the lake of fire, then what hope does anybody have at all? 
This is why it's so imperative that if that's you tonight and that you know that you have sinned against God and you know that your sin is something that you deplore and you don't love it, you don't like it, you want to be set free. Let me tell you something, folks. Your only hope is Jesus. Your only hope is Jesus. Today is the day of salvation. Look to Jesus because Jesus came into the world and did something you and I could not do. Jesus came into this world as the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of all kings, and the Lord of all lords. And the Lord came into this world without any sin, and He lived a sinless, spotless life. The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. For 33 years He was on this earth and did not sin even once. Not in word, not in thought, not in deed. Not once did the King of glory ever, ever sin. And this is very important because as we talked about before, the standard of perfection, the standard of perfect righteousness that God expects out of man whom he has created is perfection. God expects per perfect obedience. And the problem is we don't have that obedience, but Jesus does. That's why when Jesus came in, he lived a life in holy, complete obedience to the will of the Father. This is very important because when he went to the cross as the Lamb of God, this was as a substitutionary atonement for the sins of men. This is important because Jesus not only lived a sinless life, but he went to the cross on behalf of his own people, those people who would believe on him, and he died in their place. The Bible says he was made sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus the Lord. So it's on the cross that, that the sins and iniquities of God's people was placed on the Son of God. And Jesus died in their place. He took this wrath in the place of his own people. He suffered and he bled and he died as a substitutionary atonement to appease the Lord of glory, to appease God, who requires perfect and complete obedience. Jesus died in the place of sinners just like you and I, and he shed his precious blood for the remission of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins, for the reconciliation of men to God. And it's our hope and prayer tonight that you would acknowledge what Christ has done in his life and in his death on the cross of Calvary. But the story does not end there. Jesus not only died as an atonement for sin, but he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again and was declared to be the Son of God. And why this is so important is that at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we know that God accepted the sacrifice of his Son on behalf of his own people. Had Jesus ever sinned, had Jesus ever not obeyed the Lord completely, he would have remained in the grave. But that God raised Jesus from the dead, we know that God accepted the sacrifice of his own son on behalf of his own people. This is very, very important to know. Now that this redemption has been purchased by the precious blood of Jesus, the question is, how is this atoning sacrifice applicable to you and I? How is this sacrifice something that you and I can partake of? Because it's so important, Jesus said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Now, not many people would know and understand that, but what we're talking about is, is knowing God and partaking of Him and being in fellowship with God in union and communion with the Lord of glory. Amen. The only way that this can be brought about, you must be born again. That's what the Bible teaches. You must be born again. So how it works is that Christ purchased our redemption on the cross by the shedding of his own blood. The Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And this blood of the sacrifice must be applied 
to those people who are receiving the forgiveness of sins. And so when God raises the dead through the preaching of the word, the Lord has ordained that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And as the gospel is proclaimed into the nations, Bless you, brother man, hey, my brother in Christ. Amen. Keep it going. Lord, we pray Amen. in the name of Jesus, Amen. Father, that you just continue to fill him by the power of your Holy Spirit. God, that you continue to flow out of his mouth, Lord. We declare and decree that your word will not return void, Lord, that the people's eyes be open, Lord, that their ears be open, God, that their hearts receive and that they understand and be converted. You God, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, God, for your thank love you, for Lord. this man who is devoted for you for his whole life, God. His whole life, Lord. May you continue to increase him, God. May you continue to bring forth the labors into the harvest, Almighty God. May you continue to, to, to grow him, Lord, in boldness to say, I don't care, God. It's worth it all, Lord. In the name of Jesus and your love and your peace and your comfort to be with him at all times, Lord. To strengthen him at all times, Almighty God. When he don't feel like it, when it gets rough, God, that your strength, Lord, is made perfect in his weakness, dear God. I thank you for his devoted family to be out here to do your will, Almighty God. God, and we bless him, God, and Lord, yes. we pray for just more of you flowing through him, Almighty yes, God. God, a refreshment of you flowing through him, God. Holy Spirit, bring utterance and remembrance, things that he will thank never you, even Lord. said, thank and you, you just speak through him, God, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. You are risen, Jesus. You are King of kings and Lord of Amen. lords. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Love you, brother. Man. I love you, too, man. Love you, brother. I appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. Yeah, man. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah. You are. I really need that. I need that. Light in our heart. Amen. Amen. Be strength. Praise the Lord. Be strength. We, we preach Amen. the gospel, and yeah. it's, it's a rare breed. Yeah, absolutely. It. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you. So uh, too, what's your name? Lucas. I'm Don. Nice Don, to meet I'm you, Don. Tim, Don. Nice to meet, nice you. meet you. Brother Don. All right. Have a good night. You, too. Thank you. Keep on preaching. So as we've been talking about, there is a redemption that is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ the Lord. It's important to understand what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary some 2,000 years ago. But you know what? This blood must be applied to the heart of man. And how this blood is applied to the heart of man is through the imputed righteousness of Christ. Uh, the sin that was placed on Christ Jesus, he died in the place of sinners. And in return, when we believe on the Lord, that his righteousness is imputed to his own people. And in this we stand justified by faith before the Lord when we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the work of God in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. So as we look at this matter, it's the Lord that brings about this regeneration. It's the Lord that brings about this new life. Not only did he take care of the matters of the cross in this work of redemption, but he applies this work of redemption in the hearts and minds and lives of people like you and I, even here tonight. Even here tonight. And this is how it works. It's through the preaching of the word. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. This is how God has ordained. And it's very interesting because when we consider this, the fall of man, the, the fall of man was uh, if such that he heard the word of the Lord, but he disobeyed the word of the Lord. Isn't it interesting that God has chosen that through the preaching of the word of the Lord that men would be saved? That's very interesting because God requires that we would not only hear, but that we would believe the word of the Lord and place our faith and trust in Him. Hey, yeah, done. Hey, yeah, I'm done. Yeah, are you, what group are you with? Uh, uh, Evangelism Outreach Ministries. Very cool. Yeah. Do you know Ray Comfort? Anything? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, I don't know him personally. No, but, I know, but I thought you yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah I, I do I do take some things from him. Yeah. Yeah, and one of those things, yeah, one of those things is comparing us to the law, and yeah. the law gives us yeah. a knowledge of sin. Yeah. And yeah. so, and uh, yeah. yeah, and it also shows us our need for Christ. Yeah. So yeah, that's absolutely. really, really, really. Super so, cool. I, I love that. Like, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that was just knocked over and kicked around and all. Was it really? Yeah, it really oh, was. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. worked with the National Rights like years ago in Washington, D.C. Yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Well, that sign ha has really touched the nerves of many people they, they um, get, for many get, years. We've been out right here there. about 12 years. Uh, oh, awesome. And uh, we've had that sign probably five or six years. But uh, it has touched the nerves of so many people. They see that, and they're enraged. Some people are enraged, and some people love it. Yeah. 
Yeah. But these gals tonight, they're probably 18 years old, come out, uh, very hardly have started their lives. Yeah. And, and, ever even and they it. grabbed the sign, threw it down. I wanted wow. to take it with them. And just the faith, you know, we've had people paint it, kick it, spit on it. We've had throw it, kick it, you name it. But uh, it really touches a nerve because, you know, abortion is really something that's a heinous Heinous ass. Barbaric. Yeah, barbaric. People, it's barbaric. Yeah, yeah. I don't think people understand. They don't. A lot. They don't understand. I mean, you know, especially women, they're so young. Yeah. And maybe they'll understand it someday Tricked and they'll regret what they've done. Because I know yeah. a lot of people that have been on the front And they're side ripped of that. they're on the they're ripped apart inside. The rest yeah. of their they're life. rest of their life. You can it's never get rid of it. Sad. What have I done? Yeah. Yeah. So it's very uh, sad. these gals come out, they're defending it. And I said, wait a second. They says, You're calling this genocide. Or, uh, or Holocaust, I said, or genocide, and back, yeah. back and forth. I said, "Well, it is." Yeah. And they said, well, "How can you say that?" I said, "Well, how many how many Jews died in the Holocaust? Yeah. Six million. Yeah. I, I said, "How many babies have been aborted since Roe v. Wade? Since seventy three? Something like that. Sixty five yeah. million yeah. babies. Yeah. More than sixty five wow. million wow. babies." So, and that's just in America alone. That's not yeah. including Russia and China oh, and, I know. and they, England and Australia. Correct. No, we're yeah, talking we're talking right. about generations, oh, nations, nations. Wiped off the map. Wiped yeah. out. We'll never yeah. see the light of day. So yeah. women say, it's, it's my body, my choices. Wait a second. You have your body. You have right to your yeah. body. I feel like our constitution needs a clarification. <laughs> uh, absolutely. But you know what? You can't, you can't take the law of God and place it as the law of, uh, of the land, unfortunately, because... Yeah. Because really, it's a matter of a changed life. Right. I, mean, I agree. I agree. The only you, way, you it for, it doesn't. The do only it. solution to our problem is Christ and Him crucified. Agreed. That's yeah. the only because we can change all the laws, like prohibition. Yeah. In the twenties, yeah. you can outlaw drinking. What yeah. are people going to do? They're going to find a way to, <laughs> to bootleg. Distilleries and everything. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so it's really a matter of the heart of man. Yeah. Really. And so the solution is preaching the gospel. What is your name? Where, where, where? Uh, Evangelism Outreach Ministries. Got yes, it. It's on his shirt. Got it. He's got it. Dot com. Oh, cool. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Appreciate you can it. find it's us it's online. Donations. Thank you. Oh, very thank much. you. We appreciate Evangelism it. Ministries dot com. Let me tell you. Let me give you my yeah. card. Oh yeah. You got a card? That's awesome. Yeah. We've been here many times. We typically don't come out on Friday nights because of the kids, you know. Right. <laughs> but our babysitter canceled so last much. night, so. Oh, how nice. For tonight, so oh, how nice. Oh, how nice. on a Friday night. We're usually out if it's not raining. Lord yeah. willing, we're usually yeah. out. Yeah, so. I know. The last couple days, it's been torrential. It's been torrential rain. rain. We got so. water in our garage the other day. Yeah, it's us too. Yeah. So it was Caleb like, and oh. Denise Walsh. Yeah. Wow. Appreciate it. Thank well, you. wonderful, you. wonderful seeing nice you. Let's keep in touch. Please. So it's so important, for folks, that faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. So as the gospel is being preached to the nations, as people are hearing about the good news of the gospel, testifying to the Son of God, the Son of Man, the King of glory, and what he has done in his works of redemption, his work of redemption, uh, it's important to know that uh, it, it's through this that the Lord raises the dead. It's through this that the Lord provides a knowledge of sin uh, to the nations. And it's through this compelling men to believe that men uh, actually consent and assent to uh, this message of the gospel. But it's ultimately the regeneration of the heart, the, uh, the work that only the Spirit of God is able to perform that brings about this new life. And so this knowledge that a man or woman or child is receiving into their head must go into their heart, and then it's in the heart that the Lord tra change changes and transforms and enables this person to believe. This is a raising from death unto life. Uh, the Bible clearly says that men are dead in trespasses and sins, and the only hope that we have of life is Jesus. And so it's our hope and prayer tonight that as you hear the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that you have sinned against the Lord and that your only hope is in Jesus Christ the Lord and his imputed righteousness. Uh, we hope and pray that you would give your life to Christ tonight. Jesus tells us in his word that you must be born again. And this born again, uh, what this means to be born again is this is a spiritual new birth in Jesus Christ. This is not something that we can bring about ourselves, but it's through the preaching of the word that the Lord uses to raise the dead to life by his spirit. And so the Lord convicts men of their sin 
and the Lord is the one that actually turns them around, raises them from the dead, and gives them the gift of faith that they are able to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And when they do, and this happens uh, usually simultaneously, uh, as far as what we know, regeneration and justification occur simultaneously. And this is very important to know. Once you are regenerated, once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are uh, showing forth evidence of this regeneration. And this ultimately uh, the, uh, leads to justification by faith. And why justification by faith is so important is that it's not our faith that justifies, but it's the faith of Christ. And it's this faith that God grants in regeneration when a person is born again. And this faith that God grants is a faith that men believe, used to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this they are, stand before God justified as though uh, they had never sinned. So in this you receive the imputed righteousness of Christ, which is a robe of righteousness. And in this, a man or a woman or child who believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, who has received the imputed righteousness of Christ, being justified by faith, can boldly proclaim that they are a child of God. And evidence of this is, of this new life, of this new birth, of this justification, is that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and you know the Lord, and the Lord calls you His own. You belong to Him, and you know in this that Jesus is Lord. And when you know that Jesus is Lord, you're going to do whatever it is that the Lord's called you to do. There's some people that falsely claim that Jesus can be your Savior and not your Lord, but that is a false doctrine of demons. No man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Spirit of God. And when a person is born again and granted the gift of the Holy Spirit of God, their response to Him is that they believe on the Lord. They are justified by faith. They are temples of the Holy Spirit of God. And they know that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. When you know that Jesus Christ is Lord, you know that you belong to him and he is your God. And in this Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me daily. Let me tell you something, folks. When you know that Jesus is Lord, you're going to follow him. You're going to obey him. You're going to serve him. You're going to worship him. You're going to do what he tells you to do and go where he tells you to go. When you know that Jesus is Lord, your life forever changes and you're not your own. The Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. A person that truly is converted, a person that truly believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, brings forth the fruit of righteousness, this faith. This believing on the Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God that dwells inside of saints, is a Spirit of God, the Spirit of God that bears much fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. And in this, the Lord is cleaning up His people from the inside out. This is the work of sanctification. This is the work of conforming God's people into the image of His dear Son. And what's glorious, folks, is you might be a sinner tonight, you might be in bondage to your sin tonight. You might think that you're just somebody that God could never help and never deliver and never set free. But let me tell you something. The Bible says, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. It doesn't matter what your life represents. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your past history is and all the sins that you've done. God knows everything that you've done, even in secret. Those things that men don't see, God sees. God sees all things. God sees everything. There's nothing that God doesn't see. God even knows the very thoughts and the intents of your heart. There's nowhere to go, no, nowhere to run and to hide from a holy God. It's time to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. It's time to commit your life to Jesus. It's time to commit your way unto Him. The Bible says you must be born again. You must be born again. This is not a suggestion. 
If you want to go to heaven, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want your sins forgiven, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be reconciled to God, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to have the hope and glory and the promise of eternal life, you must believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to be a child of God and be adopted into his family, you must be born again. Jesus says very clearly, unless you're born again, you won't enter the kingdom of God. Unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom of God. This is so very clear, folks. There's more to life than what we see here today. There's coming a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. It's the meek that will inherit the earth. It's to meek those people that know Jesus. You can't be meek on your own. This meekness is a fruit of the Spirit. The only way that you can truly be meek is to be a child of God. And the Bible promises, it proclaims that the meek shall inherit the earth. And what that simply means is that there's coming a day, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And only the children of God will inhabit this kingdom. And this is very, very significant. If you want to enter God's kingdom, you must be born again. You must be born again. That's what Jesus says. Now, sadly, folks, there's many people here tonight that will hear this warning that goes out, and they will discount it. They will disregard it. They don't have any time for it. They lay it down. And they give up and they say, that's nonsense, that's hocus, that, that's nothing that has to do with me. But let me tell you something. God commanded all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. The reality is, folks, on the last day, the angels are going to round up the wicked. Those people that don't know Jesus on the day of judgment are going to be rounded up before the Lord of glory at the great white throne judgment. And it's on that day, at that judgment, that the souls of men are going to be stand in judgment before a holy God. And if you don't know Jesus on that day, you're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But you know, there's other people that have, whose names are not, that are found written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Their eternal destiny is going to be far different. They're going to inherit all things. And it's our hope and prayer tonight that on that day of judgment that you would stand before the Lord as his child, as his child who has been reconciled to him through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ the Lord. Is your name found written in the Lamb's Book of Life? We hope it is. If it's not tonight, we hope that you would give your life to Christ. Today is a day of salvation and reconciliation with God. Throw down your weapons of war against God and cry out to Jesus. Pray upon his name. Repent of your sins. Place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ the Lord. That's the only way that you will stand the judgment. That's the only way is a sinner can stand in the presence of a holy God is to be reconciled to God through his Son, Jesus Christ the Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.